monkeys are on the loose. They found a way to get smarter, go back in time, and change the past to rule the future. Over 200 have fanned out across time, and it's up to you to stop them from taking over. This is Ape Escape, the first game to take full advantage of the DualShock analog controller. It's an innovative new experience, and we're taking you to meet the people behind it. Just as we had begun the development of the design and concept for this game, we were invited to attend a development meeting for the DualShock analog controller. We were excited to see, right there on the table, prototypes with two analog sticks. There weren't any games that existed at the time that used both sticks, and we were so intrigued by the new opportunities. I began to think about all the fun and unique ways we could take advantage of both analog sticks. One stick could maneuver your character around a fully 3D environment, and the other is used to control the gadgets. The ideas just kept coming. There's the Stun Club and Time Net, Super Hoop, an RC car and more vehicles too. So we picked gadgets that would take advantage of and resemble the motion of the analog sticks. For example, with the slingshot, you're required to pull back on the stick and release it, emulating the controls of a real slingshot. And we think everyone will find at least one favorite gadget. Yeah, I like the sky flyer the best. Yeah, you, I can fly around. When you are really good, you can do the two-step jump and at the height of the two-step jump, you can start, you know, uh, activating the sky flyer. Uh, but uh, if you're not, not so good, you can just uh, stand and uh, start activating that sky flyer, and uh, you can get much higher, you would think. But that's not all that's unique about the analog sticks. Most people don't know that you can push the stick down like a button, too. Push it down and you can sneak up on the monkeys to catch them. I also like the way the remote control car operates with the two sticks. It turned out to be even more enjoyable than we expected. That's what I find most fun is that there are more than 200 apes in the game. We gave them different personalities and a lot of subtle humor. Something fun for everyone, I hope. Another cool feature is the added bonus levels, like the skiing game, the ape boxing, or the Monkey Galaxy. We think you'll love them. We started developing this game like two and a half years ago. Coming up with the control with the two sticks was the biggest challenge. We did a lot of, lot of testing, and we are surprised how we kept the original concept of the game we had at the outset. And uh, I think it paid off. with a victory here tonight. Hi, I'm Darren Pang, color commentator for 989 Sports NHL Faceoff 2000. So, this is a little bit of a racing driver. Now, I've always loved cars. As a child, I dreamed of being a race car driver. But that's even less likely in Japan than it is in North America or Europe. 
I created Gran Turismo because I always wanted to work with cars. I didn't expect the game to sell as well as it did. It has a real driving feel and graphics very close to reality. Those things didn't really exist in the racing genre until then. I made the first Gran Turismo for Japan with mostly Japanese cars. I'm making Gran Turismo 2 for the world. We're going to have about 400 cars on 20 tracks. We brought some of the cars here to test them and capture photos and sound. My goal is that each user everywhere can actually drive the car that you own or want to buy or just admire and will never be able to purchase. I want the owner of a car to feel that driving the car in the game is exactly like driving the car on the road. I create the car from start to finish. Today I took photographs from all angles to record details like tires, headlights and hazard lights, so I can reproduce these cars exactly. I get the plans, performance data and all the color samples from the manufacturer and apply them to the model. It takes about a week to make a car for the game. If there are problems, it could take a month. In GT1, I didn't want cars to spin when they collided so that you could keep playing the game. But gamers told me they want damage. GT2 will have an option for car damage. If you choose it and your car is hit, it will spin or become tougher to handle. But the damage will just affect how the car handles, not how it looks. One very important change is that we are going to have dirt tracks. The cars will be able to skid around. Also, there will be some drag strips. And Laguna Seca will be one of the tracks. Our job is course design. We draw the course line, model it, then apply textures and landscapes. It's very valuable for us to come to Laguna Seca. We knew from pictures how the turns here would bank, but now we can walk and drive them so we can put their exact feel in the game. Gran Turismo 2, unlike other racing games, it's not important to just go fast. Sometimes speed is not as much a factor as skill. Slowing down can be the most important thing. I have a driving school, and Yamauchi-san was one of my students. I didn't know he was the producer of Gran Turismo. The things he was learning in my school, he put into the game's driving license test. How to accelerate, how to break, how to turn the corner. If you want to enjoy Gran Turismo 2 the most, do not think of it as a video game. Drive as if you're in a real car. Drive at the highest level possible for you, and the game will teach you and raise you to a new level of enjoyment. Laguna Seca has a famous corner called the Corkscrew. I've known about it ever since I was a kid, but growing up in Japan, I never thought I'd see it with my own eyes. The day before yesterday, I drove around it and the whole course in a Viper. I thought to myself, this is my dream come true.
Jet Moto 3 is coming. What's in it that's new? You won't have time to ask. Either you splat like a fly on a windshield, or scream faster than ever through some of the coolest places on Earth, and beyond. We got the game's producer to tip you off in advance on what's new, so when you play, you can totally concentrate on saving your butt. We, we wanted to add three different things. One is speed. As much speed as possible. Two was base everything, all the track design off of skill. So you would learn basic skills as you go through the environment and then use those together in combinations of skills later when you get to the hard environment. And the third was we really wanted to take away all the barriers that were in one and two, limiting the player where he can go and where he can't go. And this time, pretty much, if you see it, you can drive on it. We tried to build in shortcuts as much as possible everywhere. Look for them. We also added a few new features. We added uh, stunt mode, uh, which everyone has been dying for. It's a hidden mode, so you're going to have to uh, figure out how to open it. It's pretty much a point-based mode. You have a certain amount of time, and you have to do a certain amount of stunts within that time period and gain enough points in order to progress through uh, five different stunt tracks. In order to get the really high scoring tricks, you got to rotate on all three axes. We added a new hop feature, which is part of the skills that I talked about earlier. And we added horizontal grapples where you can pretty much Tarzan swing using multiple grapples throughout the environment. It's pretty cool. You go through a total of 11 tracks. The last track, Planet X, is uh, extremely hard. Uh, the music on Jet Moto 3 is high energy techno uh, with different styles, loosely based on the environment. We have uh, two people working on them. Uh, Juno Reactor doing some original tunes and uh, Chucky D, our uh, internal guy here, 99 Studios. Nobody knows the game like the producer, and he had this final word to pass along. Okay, here's a hint for the Lost City level. If you want to get through the top of the observatory, don't turbo over the sundial. Just drive over it and hop at the end. There you go. Yeah, baby. <laughs> Eight, nine, studio. But I would do it like that, because I want it like that. The one that is the fact. You gotta do what? Masaya Matsura, musician, composer, star maker. It's been two years since the debut of Matsurasan star protege, Parappa the Rapper. You couldn't leave the house without seeing his smiling face plastered across cities everywhere. Well, Matsurasan is about to do it again. Switching gears from the rap genre, he's producing a hot new sensation by the name of Lammy, starring in Umjammer Lammy, and she's definitely gonna rock. With that kind of success, we have to ask, can lightning strike twice? But I'm not getting close, I'm just running, running around. Now gamers and rocker wannabes alike will have the opportunity to test their licks to everything from pop rock, to heavy metal. On a recent trip to Japan, Matsura-san and his crew found a moment in their hectic schedule to sit down and discuss their newest find and how using her musical talents, she can give you a glimpse into the world of rock and roll. I didn't want to create Parappa the Rapper 2. I wanted players to enjoy other kinds of music. Kick, boom, 
And Lammy has other differences. In Parappa the rapper, the teacher raps and then the player raps. Many players end up just imitating the teacher exactly. With Um Jam or Lammy, the teacher sings and the player plays guitar. That subtle difference gives players more freedom to experiment, let loose, and make great music. Another new feature is that you can play in cooperative mode with the CPU or in a competition mode against another person. A lot of gamers wonder where the quirky sense of humor comes from that's behind these two games. People think we must be on drugs. We don't take drugs. But there's so much pressure, I don't sleep for a week, and I get very spacey. Deadlines help us too. I face so many that my body is tuned to come up with something. Panic is my inspiration. It also helps that Matsura-san has never made a traditional video game. He's not set in his ways like other developers might be. So his staff has more freedom to give him ideas they really believe in. There's a new rock star in town, and this is one land that definitely knows her chops. Hey gang, welcome to issue 3.3 of PlayStation Underground. A lot's been going on in the gaming world since last issue, so without any further ado... I said, without any further ado... Uh, sorry. Dude, quit playing GT2 and cue the monitor. First, we were off to Rhode Island where one lucky gamer won the PlayStation truck for his school for the day. Needless to say, it bumped him up a few notches in the popularity scale. After that, we hit the track with the game from Polyphony Digital to burn some rubber and see what's under the hood of Gran Turismo 2. It's just like the real thing. Especially for anyone who's seen you drive. Sorry. Now, since we teased you with a quick look at my favorite game, Um Jammer Lammy, last issue, we thought we'd pony up the rest of the story so you can really see what makes Lammy rock. And we want to keep you all in the know about anything new regarding the next generation of PlayStation, so be sure to stop in at Tech Q&A and see what's up. I know what you're all thinking, that's cool, but what's in the vault? Glad you asked. CD2 is pushing maximum density with game demos like NFL Blitz 2000, Omega Boost, and Tiny Tank. And of course we've got enough new downloads, alphas, and hidden codes to keep everyone happy. So keep on gaming and I'll see you next issue. Okay Maggie, we're clear. Nice outfit. Hey, did you get us any Jammer Lammy t-shirts? Mmm, no.
this game will be like a real game. Real. I mean, they get a lot of input from us, us players, and we involved in this game, and uh, we just like playing. First down. How are game developers reacting to the next generation of PlayStation? As a PlayStation Underground subscriber, you get inside access. All we're seeing here today is the tip of the iceberg. You're going to see a much, much more detailed modeling, much more detailed worlds. A prediction for a road rash could possibly, on the next generation PlayStation, we would go from 300 polygons for bike and rider combination to somewhere from two to, to two to three thousand faces. The fact that you can actually render something like Toy Story on the PlayStation in, in real time is just, you know, awesome. And it's really exciting to see a home platform that's going to have uh, even surpass the power of some of the high-end military machines that we've worked with in the past. I think it's absolutely incredible that we've got a supercomputer and a game machine. The poly counts, the sound, the texture memory, we can bring everything together into a really cool compelling storyline. It'd be really cool if you would walk through a hallway and the lights would actually be carried with you like a torch, for instance. What you're going to see is a little more randomness in the ability to control the character. Because the game is all about hiding in the shadow so the guards can't see you. But if the guards had a torch with them, that would completely change the way you play the game. You'll be able to get bodies swinging around and you'll have more control. You'll be actually able to screw up a little easier, which is nice for a gamer. We want, we want to take you out into huge, vast regions of space with giant cruise ships and planets and, and space stations where you're a little tiny dot and the space station's miles and miles long. For a driving game, for example, crashing into a wall, not only will you damage your car, but you'll, you'll damage the wall and maybe repeated crashing into a wall will even knock it down. We want to do things that nobody's ever seen before. In a way, you will be able to see characters uh, talk to each other, react. There will be like a, when you impact somebody up, you will see his reaction, his facial reaction. You'll be able to interact with characters that feel like living, living entities with, with facial expressions and, and emotional reactions. It's all going to behave like real life, and nobody will have had to sit down for hours and animate it. I can't think of anything right off that we won't be able to do on the next generation PlayStation. The roof is off.
You're in the eighth grade, one of hundreds of kids. Hardly anyone knows your name. Then one night a phone call comes in. Was it real or was it a dream? I was playing Final Fantasy VII, and then I got that call, and I told it, too. I didn't believe me. I thought it was a friend telling a prank or something, because I told him I joined this and I, what I could win. It's an official from Fox TV. She says that out of over 100,000 entries, you won the grand prize. Lots of cool PlayStation stuff for your home, and something very special that would visit your school. The PlayStation Touring Attraction. 18 wheels of video game excitement. All your classmates could try the latest PlayStation games thanks to you. I called some of my friends and told them. They didn't believe me. I could have my mom tell them. It was a Tuesday night. I was upstairs. Jason was doing his own thing, and he got the call, and he couldn't believe it. Yep, he thought it was a prank. Then they still didn't believe me. I brought in some of the stuff to show them. They still didn't believe me. I said, you can go out and buy that. When I got my stuff on the box, it, they had a little writing, congratulations. I brought that in. They said, you could have scanned that on the computer. Uh, but even your most skeptical friends back off when your school principal gets a call from contest executives. Someone called from Sony uh, indicating that we had a national winner, and that was the first I heard of it. Uh, and, you know, it was Jason Marrera that won the national contest. The big day finally unfolds in your school parking lot. Your classmates can hardly stay in their seats. You go on local TV. A PlayStation 25 game for it. You get more prizes. Got to MLB 2000. It's oh. Then it's on to the truck. You're in eighth grade, one of hundreds of kids. Now almost everyone knows your name. What will you remember three years from now? Everything, I remember everything. If this is what you do for work, what do you do for fun? Pro Borders, because I'm in it. Duke Nukem 3. I just finished that game, Metal Gear Solid. Played that way too much. That's probably one of the best games I've ever played on PlayStation. I like a uh, siphon filter. Cool Borders 3, no one can touch me. Yeah, I like that game. Creeping around, you know, it's fun. The life of an X Games Pro isn't easy. You have fans chasing you. Lots of flights to catch. New tricks to master. So after work, how do you blow off steam? Lately I've been playing a lot of the Tony Hawk Pro Skater game. It's a really fun game. It gives you a rush. Yeah, I mean, when you land something, it's like, whoa! Even at the top, if you're a living legend like Tony Hawk, it's not always easy. I've only broken one bone. I broke my elbow last year after 20 years. Um, and uh, I've been knocked out a couple times. The pressure's on to be first with new moves. Probably I'm best known for like 720, which is a double spin, and then different variations of the 540, like burial 540, stale fish, just, you know, stuff like that. A lot of spinning maneuvers. How do you keep learning to do what no human being's ever done before? You just, you just kind of go and, and see if you can get the right spinning motion down and, and uh, you know, you can fall safely out of most situations. And so you just keep going until you have the confidence to just throw one down. After 20 years, what keeps Tony Hawk going? You know, I, like I said, I'm just happy that I'm still getting to do it. I've just always loved the progression, and knowing that there's new stuff to learn, that's what keeps me going. With all the pressure, how do you take a break? I play Gran Turismo and Odd World and uh, Cool Borders, and uh, my son loves Spyro. What's my favorite? By far the skate game. I mean, even if it, if it weren't my signature game, it'd be my favorite game. Skateboarding and PlayStation. That's all you need in life. 
PlayStation and the X Games. It's how some people who are paid to have fun have fun after work. PlayStation rips, man. Rehearsal for Get Out the Vote promo, take one. Wahoo! Hi, America! Hi, boys and girls! It's me, Tiny Tank! Cue the theme song. Tinky, tinky, clinky, clanky, new from Centrax, Tiny Tank, America's lovable... Wait, 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 wait. Is that my theme song? Well, it hasn't been finalized yet. Wanky, wanky, tinky, tinky, what the f*** is that? You're being difficult. You're being an I got a positronic brain. Oh, there, there, what you just did. That's the spirit we want. Who? A Centrax. It wants funding for a robot army. Ooh. To replace humans in wars. Ah, and I'm the cute little mascot. To get people to vote yes. Can I change my name at least? To what? Mechanicor, Tank of Doom. From the top, Tiny. Tiny Tank is my slave name. Oh, please. Vote promo, take two. Tiny? Tiny's not here. I am Mechanicor, take a go. Look, Tiny, you're cute and you're a killing machine. What's wrong with that? It's creepy. It's not creepy. It's cute. It's cute. A cute killing machine? That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. I got an 80 millimeter cannon for a nose. Hey, kids, is this cute? Oops. Okay, we'll wrap for the day, get another camera, try again tomorrow. You okay, Fred? I'm all right. A props, blanks for the tank next time? Next issue, we add a level editor to Project Wormhole that gives you more power in level design, and we talk about what makes a good level. Keep your ideas coming on improving our mini game. To see what other people are suggesting, go to www.playstation.com and choose PlayStation Underground online. Post your own ideas there, or mail them to us at this address. Wormhole is a team effort, and we're waiting for your thoughts. Come build a mini-game with us in Project Wormhole, a special PlayStation Underground series that explores some basics of game development. In Part 6 of Project Wormhole, we've added the ability to include animated enemies in our world. There are lots of different ways to animate models. Most rely on something called keyframes. It would take too much memory to store information about every possible position the model could be in. So instead, we store only a few of the most important frames. To animate a person jumping up and down, for example, there could be keyframes of the person standing, crouching down, at the top of the jump, and landing. In reality, there will be quite a few more keyframes than that, but there will still be gaps between them that need to be filled for the motion to look smooth. A process called interpolation is used to fill in the gaps. The program looks at the two keyframes before and after the current frame and calculates a position part of the way between the two. The two most commonly used methods of animation are called vertex animation and bone animation. In vertex animation, the location of every vertex in the model is stored for each key frame. This is easy for the program to work with, and just about anything is possible, but it uses a lot of memory, and there needs to be a separate animation for each model. Bones-based animation relies on an imaginary skeleton beneath the skin of the model. The animation data holds information about the joints in the skeleton, and the program knows how to move the vertices of the model around to keep them attached. It is even possible to use the same data to animate different models, as long as they have the same joints. 